In times when Mr. Harvey was too ill to record his broadcast, he turned the task over to the creator and sole writer of the rest of the story, his son. Here's Paul Harvey Jr. Now, the rest of the story. For Anna Robertson, at 76, there was very little left in life except for her embroidery. She was a, was a wizard with a needle and yarn. Anna lived on a little farm in New York State near the Vermont border. She had shared that country home with her husband until his death seven years before. At first, Anna fought the emptiness by busying herself with farm chores and housework, but soon life demanded a slower pace. So her daughter suggested a hobby, specifically embroidery. Turned out to be an ideal suggestion, because through this newfound recreation, Anna awakened a dormant talent of considerable proportions. She embroidered landscapes primarily, exquisite and colorful scenes, the gentle interweaving of memory and imagination. And now, as I say, she was 76. But just as her past activities had been threatened by age, so was her only remaining hobby threatened. You see, the arthritis in her fingers had grown worse. Attempting to minimize the discomfort, Anna had wrapped her hands with bandages, and when that no longer helped, she consulted a book of home remedies. It prescribed a daily dose of three cups of milk with three to five drops of turpentine. It did no good, of course. At night, the ache kept Anna awake, and by day, she found the proper grasp of her embroidery needle increasingly difficult and eventually impossible. But you know, Anna just couldn't allow herself to go to seed. She'd been active all her life, and especially now she needed an expressive outlet, something to assuage her relentless restlessness. It was about then that Anna and her sister were reminiscing, recalling their childhood, Apparently, when Anna was a little girl, she amused herself by drawing pictures. She used everything imaginable to color them, berry juice, blue and red carpenter's chalk, even the paint her father used to mark livestock. The distant memories led to more recent ones. On rainy days, Anna had delighted her own children and then her grandchildren with clever little paintings and sketches. It was nothing to be taken seriously until now. Because Anna... Inspired by the scattered recollections of an earlier pastime, marched up to the attic, retrieved a can of old house paint and a piece of canvas used to patch a threshing machine cover. And so it began. Anna would certainly have been contented with her embroidery. Instead, arthritis forced her to trade her needle for a brush, and a brand new career was only beginning. Anna had never taken a lesson in art, she had never been to a museum, had never heard of Picasso or Van Gogh. And yet she, at 76, embarked on a shining artistic adventure of 25 more years. And before that odyssey was over, she had produced 1,500 paintings and had captured the imagination, the admiration, and the respect of artists and art lovers everywhere. You never knew the aging farm woman, frustrated because she could no longer embroider. But you remember her alternative, the incomparable, undying art of Anna Mary Robertson Moses, whom you know as Grandma Moses. Only now you know the rest of the story. And now the rest of the rest of the story. I'm always fascinated by people who can take a blank canvas and create something beautiful, provocative, something that makes the viewer feel something. There are a couple of artists from my little region of the world who come to mind. Like Grandma Moses, Clementine Hunter was a folk artist who also began painting later in life when she was a grandmother. Through her paintings, Miss Clementine recorded everyday life as she experienced it, as she remembered it, on the plantation she grew up on. Miss Clementine painted on whatever was available, including cardboard remnants and scraps of wood. Her paintings are on prominent display in many museums across America. Now, a more recent painter whose work fascinates me is Elizabeth P. Morgan. Take a look. 
Elizabeth and I went to elementary, high school, and college together. Like Grandma Moses, Elizabeth painted as a child. Real paintings. Now, I did paint by number. Remember those? Elizabeth always downplays her immense talent. When asked what she does, Elizabeth's usual response is humble. I paint and draw stuff. Her website address is that same quote, www.ipaintanddrawstuff.com. While working on her degree in interior design, she was able to study art and architecture in Italy. I say that with a bit of playful jealousy. While in Italy, her passion for painting that had been dormant since childhood was revived. It was sort of her Italian renaissance. Her work has been shown in national and international exhibitions as well as in numerous publications. As you can see, I'm totally blown away by painters who can create something wonderful from a blank canvas. It's a talent I don't possess and just really can't comprehend. Now, I'm ashamed to admit that I was unaware of the talents of Grandma Moses until I heard this episode of the rest of the story. Anna Mary Robertson Moses was born on September 7, 1860 in Greenwich, New York. Anna briefly attended a one-room school before returning home to help around the farm. Grandma Moses had no formal training in art, but that didn't keep her from painting. She used all sorts of things to create her childhood paintings, just as Paul Jr. explained, but there was no inclination that she could actually earn a living from art. At the age of 12, she left home and went to work for a wealthy neighboring family. While working for that wealthy family, she fell in love, and at the age of 27, Anna Mary Robertson married Salmon Moses, a hired hand who worked for the same family. They continued working as hired help on as many as five farms at the same time. Together, they had 10 children, but only five of those survived infancy. This is a picture of Grandma Moses with two of her children. With little money, Grandma Moses decorated their house with whatever she had available to her. She made their house a home. In 1918, she used some leftover house paint to decorate this fireboard for their home. Now, fireboards were used to cover fireplaces during the warmer months to keep the heat out and also to keep the mosquitoes out. Few of them in rural America were as nicely decorated as this one painted by Grandma Moses. It's amazing that no one recognized how talented she was based on this fireboard alone. When Grandma Moses' pain from arthritis became so that she was unable to continue with her embroidery, her sister, Celestia, suggested she take up painting. As Paul Jr. explained, Grandma Moses began painting again when she was 76 years old. When Grandma Moses first exhibited her paintings, she did so at county fairs under the name Mrs. Moses. But there was little interest in her paintings. She won no prizes for her art, but she didn't go home empty-handed. She won numerous blue ribbons for her jams and preserves. As the number of her paintings grew, she needed a way to make room for more paintings, and she hoped to sell a few to pay for more painting supplies. Local drugstores agreed to display her paintings for sale. In 1939, an art collector named Louis Caldor of East Orange, New Jersey, stopped by a drugstore in Hoosick Falls, New York, just a few miles from Grandma Moses' home. Louis wasn't there to buy paintings, but he recognized the uniqueness of the paintings. He bought several of her paintings, priced between $3 and $5 a piece. Now that may not seem like much, but adjusted for inflation, that would be somewhere between $68 and $115 in today's money. Lewis took a chance. He bought the paintings and took them to New York, where three of them were put on display at the Museum of Modern Art. Inclusion of her work in the Museum of Modern Art got a lot of attention in the art world. When her paintings began to draw attention from the media, newspapers affectionately dubbed her Grandma Moses, and the nickname stuck. The price of her paintings, which she had been trying to sell from $3 to $5, were now selling for as much as $4,100. Grandma Moses was known for her electric charm. That was a quote. 
In some ways, it seems that Grandma Moses was more than just the grandmother of her biological offspring. She became everyone's grandmother. In 1952, Grandma Moses was interviewed for The Betty Perry Show. Betty asked, Grandma, do you ever wish you were back in the time of stagecoaches and engines? Now, Grandma Moses always pronounced engines with a long I, engines. Grandma Moses quipped bluntly, No, I don't care to go back. I like to go forward. The audience roared with laughter. Many consider Grandma Moses to be the greatest of all American folk artists. Like my friend Elizabeth Morgan, who I told you about earlier, Grandma Moses always downplayed her talent for painting. During one interview with CBS's Edward R. Murrow, 95-year-old Grandma Moses simply said, Anyone can paint that wants to paint. Edward R. Murrow was unconvinced. In 1969, the United States Postal Service honored Grandma Moses with this stamp, which shows her painting entitled, July 4th. The White House owns this painting. You remember that one-room school that Anne briefly attended? In 1972, that one-room school was moved to the grounds of the Bennington Museum in Bennington, Vermont. It houses the largest collection of Grandma Moses' work in the United States. In her autobiography entitled, My Life's History, Grandma Moses said, I look back on my life like a good day's work. It was done, and I feel satisfied with it. I was happy and contented. I knew nothing better and made the best out of what life offered. And life is what we make it. Always has been, always will be. She suggested that we should all keep busy, keep in good company, and always try to improve our minds and our bodies. She added, Never lose faith in what's ahead of you. Never lose faith. That's good advice. I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching. And now you know the rest of the rest of the story.